Welcome back to Proxy Hammer, everybody. And today we're going to be reviewing Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades in 10th edition after the tumultuous amount of changes that happened in the September data slate. So I haven't quite gone over this specifically yet. I do feel like there has been a shakeup in Wraiths in general, more so with the Wraith Knight, but also with Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades. So I will say this though Eldar Wraith Guard are still absolutely broken and i love it they do have counterplay now they're not as broken as they were in the beginning of the edition but they are still super powerful and yeah i want to talk about it in today's video and just kind of review wraith guard and wraith blades and talk about which ones you may want to include in your army so this is kind of a double video we'll be covering both the wraith guard and their wraith blade cousins so without further ado let us jump right into it but first, a quick overview of today's video. We're going to be looking at the stats, weapons, and special rules of Wraith Guard and Blades. We're going to be looking at both of their strengths and weaknesses, their combos and synergies, which Wraiths you should take in your army, and lastly, the role of Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades in an Elder Army, and how to use them. So starting off with the stats, we have Wraith Blades at slightly lower movement than normal Eldar. Usually Eldar move about seven inches and these move six inches, but that's still pretty fast by other faction equivalent standards. They're faster than Terminators by an inch and, you know, faster than most other armies, heavy infantry. They're also really durable with toughness seven, three wounds apiece, and a two plus save. As for the Wraith Blades melee weapons, they hit on a 4+, plus, which is a little bit dodgy. It means they probably won't be hitting that much in close combat unless you take a Spirit Seer with them. The Ghost Axe version is effective against, you know, mech targets. Strength 7, AP-2, damage 2 is nothing to write home about, especially with 3 attacks that hit on 4+. Plus. But the bonus of the Ghost Axe is that you get that 4+, plus invul save via the Force Shield. The Ghost Swords, on the other hand, are a little bit more damaging. They do have 5 attacks, but they still hit on that 4+, plus. slightly less strength, same AP, and damage 1. So they're more, you know, of a light infantry to medium infantry killer. They can deal with mech targets, you know, they can kill your normal space marines and stuff like that. But anything heavier than that, and they do tend to start struggling. As for their abilities, they can fight on death on the roll of a 4+, plus. and while this seems good on paper, it actually rarely comes into play. I've noticed that Wraith Blades are either shot to death, people don't want to really engage them in close combat, as soon as you tell them they have fight on death, they typically try to stay away. And that means basically being avoided. So, unless you're charging them into the enemy units... Most likely, this ability is just not going to come into play that much. But, you know, it's a good thing to have. And the real reason you take Wraith Blades, at least the Ghost Axe and Force Shield version, is to just sit on objectives and be tough. So, there is that. So, as for their War Gear, they do come with the option of taking the Force Shield and the Ghost Axe, which gives you a 4+, plus invulnerable save. And this really helps them survive against anything with a higher AP than minus two. So this will help you against things with AP minus three, you know, those plasma rifles from Tau Crisis Battle Suits. This will help you against a lot of high AP shooting. So do keep in mind, though, that functionally, they have the same durability as Wraith Guard against anything with AP minus two or less. So if you find yourself not really going against opponents with a really high AP weapons, then it's not going to matter all that much. As for the war gear options, again, they can take the Ghost Axe and the Force Shield, or they can take a pair of Ghost Swords. As for their unit costs, they cost 170 points for 5 and 340 points for 10, making them a bit expensive for the damage they can put out. And if you do compare them to, you know, other armies equivalents, they're typically going to deal less damage against pretty much every single target type. So, you know, if you compare them to Space Marine Terminators, Space Marine Terminators have much higher damage, the bonus to Wraith Guard is they're much tougher. So they have Toughness 7 instead of Toughness 5. And instead of getting bonuses to their damage, they will fight on death instead. As for their keywords, they are infantry, so they can move through ruins and other terrain unfettered. Okay, so on to the Wraith Guard. The Wraith Guard are pretty much the same stats as the Wraith Blades. They're slightly slower than other Eldar. Movement 6 but they're really durable. They still have that toughness 7, 3 wounds, and a 2 plus save. 
For their ranged weapons, they have two incredibly powerful ranged options. The D sights are devastating anti-infantry weapons with a high strength and AP. I mean, you do get D6 attacks per D scythe, which is very powerful. At strength 10, AP minus 4. The only drawback is they are damage 1, so they're a little bit less effective against multi-wounded models that have, you know, a high toughness. The Wraith Cannons, on the other hand, obliterate large targets and have devastating wounds. So devastating wounds will mean they ignore armor and invuls on the roll of a wound of a 6. So you can also use Fate Dice for this. Now, it's probably not the best way to use it, but you can use Fate Dice to, you know, make sure that these guys are hitting hard against targets, even with an invul save. And the Wraith Cannons also have additional range. So the D-Sites will have a range of 12, which does limit them in some ways, and the Wraith Cannons will have a range 18. As for their melee weapons, weirdly enough, they actually have a decent close combat profile. So they have higher than average strength, strength 5. They still hit on 4+, plus, but they have 3 attacks apiece. So if you are running these in units of 10, not a lot of units that are, are you know, trash or chafe units can actually handle these guys in close combat. So it was kind of funny. I had an opponent the other day. When I was running a squad of 10 of these guys, he threw 10 cultists into them, thinking that they would be held up in combat. And what he got was 30 attacks back, hitting on threes with lethal hits. And keep in mind that a spirit Spiritzer will give the unit lethal hits at ranged and in close combat. And his cultists were quickly wiped out. So I thought that was kind of funny. He was trying to, you know, kind of mess with the Wraith Guard a little bit, pin them in so that they couldn't shoot at the right targets and stuff. And he was thinking that, you know, his cultists would be able to hold them up in close combat because Wraith Guard have a notoriously bad close combat profile, quote unquote. And what he learned was Wraith Guard are actually not that bad in close combat. They are bad. Don't get me wrong, right? Having no AP does suck, but you can't just throw weak infantry into them and expect to survive. Especially if supported by a spirit seer so as for their abilities they have probably one of the best abilities in the entire index so they can basically shoot at any enemy unit after being attacked once per round and this is a very powerful ability that disincentivizes shooting at the wraith guard with overwatch or in their shooting phase and remember this is once per battle round just when an enemy unit targets this unit with attacks that means Overwatch counts. You can use that, but keep in mind you can only use it once per round. So once you use it, you cannot use it again until the next round. So pretty good ability, and you make the attacks as if it was your shooting phase, which means you get bonuses. You do not have to hit on sixes. You can still benefit from the Spirit Seer's ability, the lethal hits, as well as the plus one to hit. So obviously you're probably going to be taking these with a Spirit Seer, just because of the fact the Spirit Seer just gives so much to the unit as far as its survivability and also lethality. So you probably are going to be taking that support model and War Construct allows them to benefit from those abilities in your own shooting phase and also when using this ability. Okay, I know that was a lot, but I am going to go into why that's a really powerful ability later in this video as well, because I do think it deserves extra attention. As for their warrior options, they can either take the Wraith Cannons or D-Sites, but cannot mix and match. You have to go all or nothing. So you have to go all Wraith Cannons or all D-Sites. As for the unit costs, they cost 170 for 5 and 340 for 10. And this is pretty reasonable. They did get a point hike, but considering that they're super powerful, it is a reasonable price to pay for how good these guys truly are, right? Devastating wound shooting that can shoot twice in a battle round. Technically three times if you overwatch, although that's a little bit more suspect because they will be hitting on sixes. However, if you do have the Fate's Messenger enhancement in there, it can be really devastating on overwatch. So you roll your 10 dice on overwatch, maybe you get a six, but then you can change one of the dice into a six after that. And you can get basically two free hits at strength 10, AP minus four with D6 damage with a chance of getting a devastating wound, right? You do get a reroll, so, you know, I've done this before and it has happened. It's not impossible. Chances are low, but, you know, crazier things have happened in Warhammer 40k. As for their keywords, they're just like Wraith Blades. They're infantry, so can move through ruins and other obstructions pretty easily. Now, on to their strengths and weaknesses. So let's start off with the Wraith Guard. 
Now, the Wraith Guard are probably one of the most premier heavy infantry units, not only in just our index, but in the entire game. Now, I do think they have some pretty big weaknesses that you do need to cover with the rest of your list if you want these guys to work out for you. And when the full combo is all said and done, they do cost a pretty penny. They're pretty expensive, but they have some amazing strengths if you're willing to put in the points. They're extremely tough. Toughness 7, again, 3 wounds and a 2 plus save is nothing to laugh at, especially if they have the benefit of cover and maybe even fortune to back them up. They have extremely powerful shooting. Both the D-Scythe and the Wraith Cannon are very good. And even though I do prefer the Wraith Cannon personally because it has a little bit more range, it has the punch against hard targets and stuff like that that the D-Scythe just doesn't, the D-Scythe is still a very good option if you're looking for something that can clear enemy infantry out of the middle of the board. It is very strong. They can also shoot after being attacked. So, like I said, this is a very big aspect to the Wraith Guard's success because your opponent is going to have to think really hard about how they want to actually deal with these things, which means they're going to have to plan their movement, they're going to have to plan their damage, and they're going to have to do it in a certain order to prevent, essentially, the Wraith Guard from being able to wreck their day. And this is especially true of their movement phase, because if they move anything within 18 inches of those Wraith Guard, and then they try to attack those Wraith Guard, whatever large targets are in that vicinity are going to die. So your opponent does need to be very careful, which is one of the biggest strengths of the Wraith Guard, is basically controlling the board space around them. Their weaknesses, however, are they do have very short-ranged weapons. The Wraith Cannons, although the longer range, are still range 18, which is not the greatest. Opponents can easily move around that. There's a lot of 24-inch weapons in the game that can shoot at the Wraith Guard, and the Wraith Guard won't be able to shoot back. They also hit on a 4-plus without buffs. So, again, unless you're willing to invest in the Spirits here, which you always should, but it is an extra cost, right? So they do hit kind of not that well. And you might even want to invest in Guide because, again, these guys are going to be shooting twice every battle round, typically. So you're going to probably want to have them hitting reliably when they do. They're also somewhat slower than other Eldar and have some really hard counters. So they are still infantry. Anti-infantry weapons will burn them down quite easily. And there's a lot of combinations in the game that can get past their high toughness. And in general, there's just a lot of things that Wraithguard can't really do anymore that they used to be able to do in the beginning of this edition. So Wraithguard can't really engage tough units in close combat anymore. I gave you that example against the Cultists, but Cultists are pretty much a trash unit, right? You throw those in there to basically hold up enemy units or to hold objectives in your own backfield. They're not a fighting unit. A good fighting unit will take Wraithguard apart in seconds. Especially things like Thunderhammers. So many people don't realize this, but Thunderhammers are extremely effective against Wraithguard. Basically, they pop a Wraithguard with each failed save. So if a big unit of Terminators with Thunderhammers gets stuck into these guys it's going to be bad news for you. And this means that you do have to be careful with them, right? Moving them up to the middle of the board to contest the middle against, you know, some Deathwing Terminators or, you know, some other type of Deathwing or Terminator Death Star is not probably the best way to use them, and you do need to be very careful with that. Now, having said that, there are support models that can help you in those situations. For example, if you have a Night Spinner, or you have extra command points for Phantasm, you can outplay your opponent and make your opponent think that you're going to, you know, sit there and fight with them, but then Phantasm back or hit them with the Night Spinner and slow them down so that they can't get a charge off. And then your Wraith Guard are free to wipe them off the face of the earth. But again, this is something that is resource intensive. This is command points. This is buffs. This is, you know, using Eldar mind games, stuff like that. So... You know, there is a lot that goes into this unit, more than you would normally think. All right, what about Wraith Blades, though? So what are the strengths and weaknesses of them? A lot of us love Wraith Blades. I have a unit of Wraith Blades myself with the Ghost Axes and Force Shields. I think they're super fun. I think they're a cool unit. They look cool, certainly. But they do have some considerable drawbacks that, you know, make them a little bit less popular. And one of those things is that they are easy to ignore and screen out. So 
They're a melee unit. They don't have any range capability whatsoever. And they're kind of slow. And because of that, they're easy to screen and basically just ignore for most of the game. There are definitely ways to get them into combat, but they also require some assistance. So they hit on 4+, plus. that's not great. Even if you try to go for the Ghost Sword variant for extra damage, you're only getting 5 attacks apiece. Not many of those are going to hit, and if you actually add it up in your head and do the math, they don't actually do that much damage, even to normal Space Marines. Okay, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's say you buy a unit of Wraith Blades, and they cost 170 points, right? Now, you field them with the Ghost Swords because you think that, you know, having the more attacks and, you know, higher damage capability is going to allow them to trade up into other enemy units. And the first thing you do is you charge them into a unit of Intercessors. Now, on paper, the matchup looks really good, right? You have your Wraith Guard. They have a high strength, they have a decent amount of AP on their attacks. Things should go well. So you make your attacks, you get 25 of them, and about 13 hit, on average. Then you roll to wound, and let's say you get 9 wounds. You have a little bit of help from Unparalleled Foresight, and you end up getting 9 wounds. Your opponent rolls their save, they roll average, and they lose 3 Space Marine Intercessors. So far, so good, right? They attack back. Maybe the sergeant has a power fist or something like that. Maybe not. They don't do much damage. Maybe they do a couple of wounds to a wraith blade. And that's it. So you have now won the combat. And you haven't taken a lot of damage in return, right? Well, this is what's going to happen next. Your opponent is going to fall back with the two remaining space marines. Those space marines are now probably going to just go after objectives or something like that. Or they may actually just perform actions, right? They're going to be basically useless for the rest of the game as far as damage goes. So your opponent is most likely going to use them for other things. So technically, your opponent still has a useful unit on the battlefield. Now, what your opponent's going to do next is because your Wraith Blades are going to be out in the open, probably. You're going to get shot at. And because the Wraith Blades with the Ghost Swords do not have any kind of invul save most likely they're going to die. So your Wraith Blades will have killed about maybe 60 points worth of models, maybe a little bit less than that, and the opponent will have a very easy time mopping them up and will net themselves a clean, crisp 170 points. So that's usually where Wraith Blades are at if you use them offensively. If you use them to kill enemy units, they're never really going to do a great job. Yes, they'll kill the enemy unit for the most part, but they're not going to do a whole lot of damage. They're not going to wipe out an entire squad in one hit unless you, you know, throw the spirits here and there, and then they probably will end up doing that. But it's more points to spend. So, in other words, their melee damage isn't that great for their cost. You pay a lot of points, not for their melee capabilities, but for their extra durability. And this is really where, in my mind, Wraith Blades come into their own because they are very tough with the Force Shield. If they can get that 4-plus invul save, and they can get onto an objective on a flank, there's not a lot that your opponent can do to move them off of it without expending significant resources. If your opponent wants to bring some Plasma Fire into the battle and aim them against the Wraith Blades, guess what? They're going to have to deal with a 4-plus invul save and perhaps maybe a Strands of Fate dice in there as well if you haven't used it on something else making them extremely tough. If they don't kill the unit, then if you have a Spirit Seer in there, which you probably should, one Wraith Blade is going to come back each turn. So, during your turn, basically. So you're going to get an additional Wraith Guard each turn if your opponent just peppers the unit or can't deal with it effectively. So, in other words, your Wraith Blades are really good at holding objectives. And if your opponent tries to engage them in close combat, they fight on death on a 4+. So unlike the Wraith Guard, who are very weak to close combat and can't really deal with Terminator equivalents in close combat, Wraith Blades can easily step up to the plate. And even if they start dying, they're going to be able to hit back on a 4+. Which, again, their weapons aren't the best, but they can wound Space Marine Terminators on a 3+. And typically, you can get at least a couple of wounds on each one when you fight back on death and if your opponent ignores them and decides that oh, well they're just too much trouble they're not worth it 
then you can score on primary points pretty much the entire game and you have secured an objective in your favor. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the combos and synergies that Wraith Guard have. So Wraith Guard, you have the spirits here who can revive one per battle round, so once during your own command phase, gives them plus one to hit and lethal hits on top of that. Now, lethal hits is a lot better on the D sites because it doesn't counteract the devastating wounds that, you know, the Wraith Cannons have, but lethal hits is still decent, right? Even on the Wraith Cannons, I've noticed that with the nerfs to devastating wounds, Oftentimes, against a lot of enemy units, unless they have a 2 plus save, they're not really going to get much of a save anyway. So, proccing that devastating wound on something that doesn't have an invul is often not even, it, it doesn't matter basically. So, getting that lethal hit, getting that free wound in is kind of nice to have. It also gives them again plus one hit so that they can hit more reliably. Guide is absolutely perfect on them. And that goes for both variants. The D Scythe and the Wraith Cannon can do extreme amounts of damage when you're re-rolling all their attacks, hitting on a 3+, plus with re-rolls. It's just absolutely amazing. And also, I mean, anything large is obviously going to die to the Wraith Cannons, but infantry as well. Even the Wraith Cannons can do significant damage against infantry if you get those re-rolls. Vipers can remove a target's cover, which is effective, again, against units that are going to have a great save. Units with a 3 plus save, for example, that are benefiting from cover are essentially getting a 2 plus save against those Wraith Cannons, so removing the cover will basically ignore armor. Fortune makes them even more durable, giving them minus 1 to wound, so a lot of weapons are going to be wounding on 4s against these guys. If they're, you know, like plasma guns and stuff like that, they will now be wounding on 5 plus. Light infantry weapons like bolters will now be wounding on 6s, which is incredibly nasty. Night Spinners can slow enemies down, preventing engagements or close combat. So like I said before, these guys are weak to certain close combat units like Terminators. If you can get a Night Spinner on those Terminators and slow them down, the Wraith Guard will have time to essentially ruin their day with Wraith Cannons and or d sites. As for the combos and synergies of Wraith Blades, the Spirit Seer again is a great unit to consider with these guys as the Spirit Seer gives them much needed survivability gives them lethal hits, which improves their damage a little bit in melee, and gives them plus one to hit. It is less useful than on the Wraith Guard, but it's still a good option. Fortune makes them incredibly tough, which is a good thing, especially on the Force Shield version. Guide can be kind of useful, although they're not really a damage-dealing unit, so I'd save it for a more shooty unit, personally. And lastly, Doom helps them wound targets a lot easier. So, usually they're going to wound things on threes, Doom helps them wound things on twos, which makes them, you know, hit a lot harder against the heavy infantry that they're going to be going up against. So, a lot of you may be asking, well, Proxy Hammer, which wraiths should I take? So, this is the general consensus in the community, and I think it's still pretty much valid, even though they got a points increase in this last data slate. And that is Wraith Guard with Wraith Cannons are still going to be considered the best due to extremely high anti-large damage with the combination of devastating wounds. And because of the fact that you can give the Spirit Seer Fate's Messenger for essentially free devastating wound procs during your and your opponent's turn, this is going to be the optimal build for some time to come. However, d sites are also a great anti-infantry option, Although the weapon range is short, and I think this does kind of play into people being able to play around it a little bit. Especially fast armies that have the mobility to stay out of their range. So these sites are good, but in my experience, they're mostly good against slower armies that have less reactionary ability. Wraith Blades with Ghost Axe and Force Shield are a strong objective holder, but they don't really do a whole lot outside of that for the points you spend. So if you're going to spend points... On Wraiths, or at least Wraith Blades, you should probably take the Ghost Axe Force Shield version. And you probably shouldn't field them as a unit of 10, because it's going to take effectiveness out of the rest of your army. You know, you're going to be spending an extra 170 points for the 10 extra Wraith Blades. And you probably don't need that to hold a side objective. A unit of 5 is not always going to be able to survive in the middle of the board, and typically, Eldar don't want to play in the middle anyway, so if you need an objective holder for the flanks, Wraith Blades are a good option for this. 
But I think fielding them as a unit of 10 is just asking to be ignored, right? If you have a big blob of Wraith Blades just sitting on a center objective the whole game and you spend 400 points to do that, I think that's kind of a bad trade and you can easily be ignored. This is the example I would give you guys. And and Wraith Blades are, by the way, less survivable than Necrons, right? So a blob of Necron Lich Guard still cost about 400 points when you factor in all the characters and stuff like that. They're a little bit more survivable than Wraith Blades, you know, with the four shields. But they're also much tougher. And every single game you play against Necrons, you should be just ignoring that unit. If that unit of Necrons takes the center of the board, let them. Let them take the center and kill everything else in your opponent's army and just leave the Lich Guard in the middle of the board. Yes, your opponent's going to score a lot of primaries, but the rest of their army is going to be dead because your opponent had 400 points locked up into a unit that didn't do anything else besides just sit there. And a lot of opponents, a lot of experienced opponents will do the same thing to you if you bring a unit of 10 Wraith Blades. So when you're bringing those, just keep that in mind. You probably want to keep them small, keep them, you know, durable, effective, but not something that's just going to be ignored. You know, your opponent is going to have to interact if you have a unit of five on a flank objective or, you know, a side objective or something like that. So kind of talking about that a little bit more, what are the ideal unit sizes for each Wraith unit? So Wraith Guard with Wraith Cannons, you do want in a unit of 10 with a Spirit Seer, Right. Their ability is just too good not to be taking these guys in a unit of 10 and maximizing that with a Spirit Seer with Fate's Messenger, or if you want to play more defensively with your Spirit Seer, a Phoenix Gem. They're just such a good buff sponge and everything like that. You do want to run Wraith Guard as a unit of 10. The D Sites can either be run as a unit of 5 or as a unit of 10 with the Spirit Seer as well. However, keep in mind that the Big Blob runs the risk of being outranged and kited against faster opponents. Wraith Blades with Ghost Axes and Force Shields should be run as a unit of five. The Spirit Seer is optional. It does give a lot to the unit, but you also don't need it. Because quite frankly, the Wraith Blades probably aren't going to be stuck in combat to the point where their damage is actually going to be a deciding factor in the game. This is a solid unit to hold objectives on a flank, but it's also not too expensive. So, you know, again... Running a full unit of these guys, like I said before, runs the risk of your opponent just ignoring them, focusing on the rest of your army. And because you're spending so many points on those Wraith Blades, the rest of your army is not going to be as powerful. Okay, so what is the role of Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades in an Elder Army, and how do you use them? So Wraith Guard are a denial unit with powerful shooting, while Wraith Blades are a primary objective holder that can tie enemy units in combat. Both units are extremely tough, but they're not unkillable, so you do want to use cover to your advantage. And that goes for both units, right? If you can get into an objective and also have cover from certain enemy units, you want to be able to do that because it's just going to make them harder to remove, especially against high AP weapons. While both units can take the center of the board, it's not always advised against certain armies or opponents. If your opponent has a lot of high-strength weaponry... With a lot of AP, you don't want to put your Wraith Guard in the center of the board, right out in the open. I'll tell you that right now. Especially with the point changes that have come in September. So one of the biggest things that I've seen recently that has been absolutely shredding Wraith Guard left and right are Tau Crisis Battlesuit Blobs. So basically you can take a unit of six Crisis Battlesuits for around 350 points, which is less than the Wraith Guard with the Spirit Seer. You can give them buffs, you can give them plus one to hit, and stuff like that, which can make them even more accurate. And then they're essentially putting out 18, strength 8, AP minus 3, damage 3, plasma shots against your Wraith Guard. Which will be very effective against them. And with the right buffs, those plasma rifle crisis battle suits can probably take out half of your Wraith Guard pretty easily. This is on top of the Skyray missile gunships that they have as well that are very cost effective. They're only 130 points now, so they're very good. And, you know, pretty soon you're just going to have a dead unit, right? After one shooting phase. So, while you can take the center of the board with Wraith Guard and while they are tough, 
They're not that tough. Even with buffs like Fortune, there are armies out there that can deal with high armor save units and high toughness units very easily. Imperial Guard, Dark Eldar, Thousand Sons can just shower your Wraith Guard in so much firepower that they're not going to be able to survive. So do be careful about that. And definitely think about the matchup before you march your Wraith Guard into the center of the field. So in conclusion, both Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades are extremely tough and difficult for any opponent to deal with without the right tools. Wraith Guard will most likely still be the strongest choice just due to their insane denial ability and range. Obviously, to prevent kiting, you want the Wraith Cannons just for that little bit of extra range. But Wraith Blades are also a great choice if you need a really tough objective holder to hold the flanks of the battlefield. And lastly, just remember, even though these units are very tough, they're not unkillable. So exposing them to needless risk is not something you want to make a habit of. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much to all my patrons and supporters who have supported the channel over the last months. We're almost at 3,000 subscribers, and I think if we could hit that before the end of October, that would be a really cool milestone. So again, thank you so much for your continued support. If you do want to support the channel through Patreon, I have free trials activated, and that will grant you permanent access to our Discord community, which is a community of Eldar players and enthusiasts who like talking about strategy, tactics, and of course, hobbying. I will leave the link for that in the description. If you want to support my channel in other ways, I do have a channel store page to grab some Eldar-inspired apparel to rep your local game store, or an Amazon affiliate link if you want to grab some discounted Eldar miniatures. Both of those links will be in the description as well. Now, lastly, I do want to make kind of a little bit of an announcement here. I'm going to do an official announcement in a future video, but I am currently working on an Eldar Knight unofficial 10th edition index. So if you guys don't know this, Eldar Knights were a 40k epic army based on the Exodites. Basically, they're the contemporaries to Imperial Knights and Chaos Knights and things like that, but for the Eldar. So I am currently working on this and will update you guys through the channel over the next weeks and months as the project gets closer to completion. I am going to have a Kickstarter so we can have some good art for it and, you know, maybe in the future some STL files that are compatible with some of the models and some of the ideas that I have in my mind. As we go forward, I don't have this stuff yet, but I will announce it on the channel as more information becomes available. This is also going to be a community-driven project. So what that means is you guys are going to be the driving force behind this, your ideas. I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear your feedback about the codex or index, I should say. As I work on it, I will kind of give it to you drip by drip as I get done with more data sheets. And as I complete things and balance things and iron things out with the rules, I will share that with you guys. And of course, I hope to get some, you know, honest feedback from you. And then eventually the plan is once everything's complete, once we have a working index, I will go ahead and drop that in my channel's Discord, which you can get access to by, you know, becoming a free Patreon member through a free trial or, you know, supporting the channel in any of the ways mentioned previously. And then, you know, once I officially finish the project, I will put the entire index for free via digital download into the channel's Discord so that everybody can access it and use it. Now, of course, this will be an unofficial index. This is not something you can use in tournaments or any kind of match play, but it's something you can have fun with. And, you know, I feel like Imperial Knights, you know, the Imperium gets Knights, even Chaos gets Knights and stuff like that. So I feel like the only fair thing is, is that Eldar gets some Knights too, right? I think that's the only fair thing. So Eldar are a really cool faction and I'd love to see them be expanded ever more. So I'm hoping to work on this and expand it, not officially, but... For those of us in the community to continue to enjoy the best faction in the game. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today. Peace out. I'll see you guys next time and have a good one. Have some great games this weekend, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a good one, everybody. See you later.